I'm doing a uh, initiating a series I'm going to call Bungling Burns, which concerns how his musical editors have bungled the publication of his songs with their proper melodies from the source books from which they were written for over two centuries. There's a lot of reasons and it gets thick and one of those reasons is, well, in this case, I'd call it moralistic spite of a respected musicologist named John Glenn in 1900 concerning Neil Gow. Neil Gow is a legendary fiddler of the 18th century, known for the Struts Bay Reels. There were five collections published by he and his son, Nathaniel. Burns, Robert Burns met Neil Gow during his Highland tour in 1787. He described the fiddler in his journal as, quote, a short, stout-built Highland figure with his grayish hair shed on his honest social brow, an interesting face marking strong sense, kind open-heartedness, mixed with unmistrusting simplicity. Neil's son Nathaniel, who contributed compositions and arrangements to his father's books, visited Dumfries in 1793. Burns wrote to James Johnson that October, I was much obliged to you, my dear friend, for making me acquainted with Gao. He is a modest, intelligent, worthy fellow, besides his being a man of great genius in his way. I have spent many happy hours with him in the short while he has been here. John Glenn holds a different view of the Gows, on whom he goes as distractedly sour as he did on William Stenhouse. Now, John Glenn published Early Scottish Melodies in 1900. William Stenhouse had uh, contributed notes to all 600 songs in the Scots Musical Museum in 1820, and he, he was one of those people who liked to make up a story if he didn't have the facts. Um, and so his, his research is notoriously fanciful, but he wasn't always wrong. And John Glenn sneered at him. He corrected all of his errors pointedly in this book and, and sneered at him even sometimes when he was correct. So John Glenn holds a different view of the gals on whom he goes as distractedly sour as he does on Stenhouse. His sternest opprobrium is reserved for Nathaniel. Quote, our, the royal hour, our impression is that Stenhouse derived his information from Nathaniel Gow, who was guilty of renaming the tunes of other musicians, and in some cases, with slight alteration, appropriating them as his own compositions. We suspect that if his work was done with an honest intention, Stenhouse was played upon by some unscrupulous person. Glenn accuses Neil Gow of plagiarizing Miss Admiral Gordon Strathspey by William Marshall for his Major Graham. Though the pieces are only superficially similar, Miss Admiral Gordon Strathspey goes to, uh, Of all the earth the wind can blow, Of all the earth the wind can blow, I dearly like the west, For there the bonny lassie lives, Alas, that I do best, Though wild woods grow and the river frow, we mourn a hill between. Faith day and night, my fancies flecked as ever we my jean. I see her in the dewy flowers, so lovely, fresh and fair. I hear her voice in the oak of bird, we music charm the air. There's not a bonny flower that springs by fountain shore green, nor yet a bonny bird that sings, but minds me, O oh, my Jean. Major Graham goes like this. O oh, my love's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. O oh, my love's like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. As fair art thou, my bonny lass, so deep in love am I, and I will love thee still, 
my dear, all the seas gang dry. Till all the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. And I will love thee still, my dear, while the sun's all light shall run, and so on. Are those the same tune? John Glenn thought they were. Glenn examines Stephen Clark's, this is the editor of the Scots Musical Museum. I'm just proving that he, he had these books. He uh, analyzed my Mr. Charles Graham's Welcome Home from the second collection of Strauss Bay Reels and identifies the tune to Oh, Gin My Love, We're Yon Red Rose in the Scots Musical Museum as Lord Balgoni's favorite in the fourth collection, again accusing Nathaniel Gow of fraud committed by his having called it a very old Highland tune, while Glenn asserts that it was composed by Alexander Campbell, presuming that Gow knew and ignored this information. Glenn notes of the air used by Burns for the Banks of Nith. This tune is a Highland one called Roby Donna Gorach, or Daft Robin, and is contained in D Daniel Dow's Ancient Scots Tunes, circa 1775. Also in the Reverend Patrick MacDonald's Collection of Highland Vocal Airs, etc., 1784. It is contained also in the McFarland Manuscript, 1740 that Glenn ignores the unique variant of Roby Dona Gorach and Neil Gow's first collection of Strauss Bay Reels, the basis for the museum's setting, is no oversight but one example of his insidious exclusion of mention of the Gow's sets of traditional airs. The following tunes used by Burns have variants named as follows in the Gow's books that go unmentioned by Glenn. Killy Cranky, The Suitor's Daughter, Duncan Davidson, Stumpy Strathspey, Andrew and his Cutty Gun, Wati Hwa I Met Yestreen, Roy's Wife, This Is No My Ain Hoose, Mount Your Baggage, Over the Water to Charlie, Mrs. Kinloch's Favorite, Madam Cassie, The Old Lee Rig, The Bob of Fetter Cairn, and Link Him Dodie Strathspey, which goes to Sick a Wife as Willie's Wife. Linkum Dotty, that one. A great setting of that melody. This limited visibility for Gao continues with later editors, as James Dick, Songs of Robert Burns to the Original Melodies to which they were written, published in 1903, just yet missing many of the original melodies to which they were written, and James Kinsley's Complete Burns Oxford edition of 1968. While regularly citing Oswald, Bremner, McGibbon, Aird, and William Thompson, follow John Glenn in omitting mention of these tune variants found in Gao. Gao's name appears in Burns' scholarship only when he has actually composed the tune. Only those of his tunes that were presented by the museum appear, and those are given as altered by Stephen Clark. I want to show you how Stephen Clark bungled. The melody to My Love is Like a Red, Red Rose. Uh, he did this to James Oswald's melodies, William McGibbons, etc. He was a church organist from Durham, England, and his music has been copied as authoritative and never corrected. So, the first line of Major Graham again goes, Oh, my love's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Here's the museum. Instead of starting below the tonic, oh, he starts it on the tonic, he has to conventionalize it, and he takes out the grace note at the foot of the octave from which it springs, from which the rose itself springs. Here's the museum. Oh, my love's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Let's throw the magic away with both hands, shall we, Mr. Clark? So, 
Sir Tovey read Stenhouse's notes, and Stenhouse pointed out that the Scots Musical Museum had bungled not had bungled the form of the song. The song, uh, the tune has a repeated A part of four measures and a B part of eight measures. The A part is supposed to cover, it has a repeat sign and it's supposed to cover verses one and two. But Stephen Clark ran the stop sign and then he put verses two and three on the B part and he left the fourth verse as a stray outside of the score. Nobody knew what to do with this. And so they replaced, the melody was replaced in 1821 in the Scottish Minstrel by R.A. Smith and he put it to a tune called Low Down in the Broom. A tune with, which Burns knew and chose never to write to, okay? And if you hear, if you go on YouTube and you hear lots of versions of My Love is Like a Red Red Rose, they're almost all sung to that melody which sounds romantic and sentimental. Whereas the Major Graham melody sounds transcendent. It's the ecstatic beloved. And Serge Hovey read Stenhouse's notes and, oh, I'm going to fix this up. And he gave it to Gene Redpath to sing, and he said, I've taken this from Neil Gow's book. Here's the correct setting. But he didn't take it from Neil Gow's book. He took the corrupted version from the Scots Musical Museum. Charming. So, let us continue about John Glenn. Uh, John Glenn's music collection, of enormous collection of dance music, was purchased at auction following his death in 1904 by Lady Dorothea Ruggles Bryce and donated to the National Library of Scotland in 1918. According to the library, quote, there are more than 330 publications contained in about 320 selected from the collection of John Gow. Yet their online digital gallery is conspicuously lacking Neil Gow's volumes. Neither James Dick nor James Kinsley give evidence of having consulted the books at all. Kinsley noted Burns' indication of tune, Callum Shiarglitz, from Neil N. Gow's third collection, that's quoting Burns, for the Dumfries volunteers in the Alloway manuscript. But he's left it to me to print the stirring melody. He noted the indication for Lady Stuart Struts Bay for to a woodlark in his commentary but did not locate the tune in Gow's first collection of Straths Bay Reels, to which Burns refers on multiple occasions. In fact, he did not put any tune indication with the song. So, the woodlark. The way the rose sprang an octave is signature for Burns. He liked to create his prosodic effects on the subject, not on the verb. So, in his melody to uh, a song called Westland Winds, he called it Song Composed in August, the earliest uh, version we have of it was called Harvest or Harvest, anyway. Now waving grain wide o'er the plain, it's a double grace note, and the grain itself waves. He doesn't say waving, he says, grain white o'er the plain. There's another version, the early version goes, now waving crops with yellow tops. So that's signature. It matters what tune Burns wrote to, because he wrote very specifically, and there's a real magic. And uh, I just put up this whole song called uh, To a Woodlark. And that was written to Lady Catherine Stewart Straths Bay, and I will sing you just the uh, first first line. Oh, stay, sweet warbling woodlark, stay, nor quit for me the trembling spray. So we heard the woodlark warble. Woodlark, it's warbling. That's Robert's artistry, and uh, I'm attempting to unearth it. Yeah, oh, so this tune, Column Shargless, was published in Neil Gow's third collection, and uh, it was called an old Highland tune. He didn't claim to have written it. <laughs> 
and it's interesting because uh, Burns wrote this late in his life, and he uh, he sent it to papers with uh, another popular tune. I'm, I'm, it's not coming to mind at the moment. But this is the early manuscript, and I think it was the early melody. Scholars discuss whether this song was sincere or if he was simply trying to keep his job with the excise because he'd come under suspicion of sedition a couple of years before. I believe the song is absolutely sincere. Uh, and I think when you hear it with this melody, you'll have no question. Pardon my, I don't know this that well, but I'll give you the idea of the tune. As haughty gall invasion threat, and let the loons beware, sir. There's wooden walls upon our seas, and volunteers on shore, sir. The death shall run to courts in con, and crib a sinking soul we we permit a foreign foe on British ground to rally. Oh, let us not like snarling curs in wrangling be divided till slap come in and uncle loon and we are undecided. Be Britain still to Britain true, among ourselves united, or never but by British hands, mon British ranks be righted. Just two more verses. Uh, I'll eventually record it when I know it better. Uh, like a score of it, get in touch with me. That's ultimately my goal with this book, to get some of these, you know, as close to Burns's intent as possible to some young singers over in Scotland who who, who pick them up and uh, restore, restore this legacy and increase the respect for Burns's creative authority and for his ability in matching lyrics to tunes. Please subscribe to my channel and uh, up with Neil Gow. Thank you.